Welcome to another episode of Grieving Voices. Today, my guest is Lizzie, and she reached out to me to be on the podcast, and we kind of have a similar story um, of loss. Uh, it was my grandmother, then my father, and the uncle as well. Um, and Lizzie has shares that experience as well. So she's going to speak to it from her perspective as a 20 something, correct? Correct. All right. Um, we'll also dive into uh, her faith and how that's been shaped by those losses. And so, um, yeah, take it away, Lizzie. Thank you for being here. And I'm trying to see how I can, because if you're not going to introduce yourself, I'm going to have to edit this out. If you're not going to introduce, do you want to introduce yourself? Um, I can. I'm not sure. I hadn't really thought about how to, to be honest, but I can, I can try to say something more introductory if that would be helpful. Let me start over. We'll okay. start over. Okay. Welcome to another episode of Grieving Voices. Today, my guest is going to share her experience of similar losses to me. Uh, she had lost her grandmother, her father, and then her uncle and at a young age, and I can relate to that. And she's also going to speak to how her faith has been shaped by those losses. Uh, Lizzie, thank you for being here. Um, welcome. Thank you. Yeah, it's sorry um <laughs> ooh, okay um so at that point would you like me to just like share a little bit about my story or like what what would be helpful to say initially I guess well maybe just your first you know I'm Lizzie I'm from I'm your age I think mm -hmm. that because I haven't had a younger person Okay, I take that back, one other younger person. But most of the people have not been in their 20s that have been on the podcast. Okay. I'm interested in people knowing that you're speaking from that angle. So your name, your age, maybe where you're from. Okay. And then I can, I'll ask you a question to get okay. you going. All right. Sounds good. All right. Yes. Thank you, Victoria, for having me here. Um, I'm... Yeah, I'm Lizzie. I'm 21 years old, um, and I grew up in Arizona. Um, yeah, and I'm really excited to be here today and get to talk with you. Awesome. So when we spoke briefly before we started to record, you had mentioned that your, you had lost your grandmother when you were seven. Um, was that your first significant loss? Yes, it was. Um, I think... At that point in my life, I think maybe I'd lost a pet or something. I'd maybe been to a funeral for someone I didn't know, but it was the first time I really experienced someone that I knew and cared about um, being gone. And it was hard because I hadn't had a very close relationship with her. She lived far away, um, just in another state, but um, I didn't get to see her much while she was, I don't think I ever got to visit her actually while she was sick. Um, and so that was really hard for me, not really getting to say goodbye, even though I was so young and didn't fully understand or have like the depth of relationship that I would have if, um, if she stayed alive later into my life, it was definitely hard to find out that she was gone, um, without really having gotten to see her and say goodbye. And then your, your father, was he, um, I know he passed away of, of cancer. Was it colon cancer? Too? Yes. Uh, same cancer as my dad had. Um, I'm curious when, how long had he known? Like when was he diagnosed? Yeah, so he, my dad was diagnosed with colon cancer when I was 11 um, and he was sick for about 10 months. Um, and at the beginning, at least from my perspective, it seemed like it was going to be a pretty um, quick surgery and then he was going to be done with it. It's kind of how my parents had explained it to me. And I think even then that was their understanding. Um, but there just continued to be complications 
Um, and he continued to, you know, get better and worse, um, over time. And then, um, yeah, it was about 10 months later that he passed away. First of all, my heart goes out to you. I know what that loss is like. I don't know what it was like for you. Um, so during that time, because I was a little bit younger, um, my dad, it was, he was, it was two years. He had stage four when he was diagnosed and there was really nothing he, they could do, but he um, lived for two more years. Um, but, and he passed away when I was eight. So much of my childhood, he was sick. But what did you, do you recall? I mean, and that's still quite a little bit fresh for you because again, you're 21. Um, I'm much further out from my loss. Um, what has that grief, I hate to say the word journey because it's so overused, but what has that been like for you? Yeah, um, it's definitely been um, long and it's, it's just changed so much over the years. I think um, initially when my dad passed away, it was very hard and intense, but it also think like I, I'd been, and my family talks about this a lot that we, and I think it's common with cancer that people kind of start grieving before the person's even died. Um, and so like that process had kind of started maybe a few weeks before for me, when I found out there wasn't really anything more the doctors could do. My dad was already in a pretty, um, bad state where he couldn't really communicate with us much. Um, and so that, yeah, there was a season where everything's kind of blurry looking back, honestly, but I do remember times even in that where I was confused about how okay I was in certain moments and I didn't know if that was right. Um, it felt like I should just always be upset, but I think maybe the way we've been designed in some ways is to have that relief and have a little bit of um, being able to continue with life, um, even when someone's gone. And so there was a lot of back and forth with that of like times when I was upset that I didn't think I should be and times when I felt calmer than I thought I should be. And especially as a child, like I didn't fully know how to process that, but my family, um, definitely helped a lot. And then like, as I've grown past that, obviously, like it gets better, but it never really goes away. And so there's still times when it really hits me hard and I don't know um, necessarily how to communicate that to other people. Um, but I do um, spend a lot of time in prayer in those times when it just feels like, um, you know, I'm not necessarily dealing with the, the death itself self anymore in the same way that I was. Um, but just with the fact that, you know, I've spent my entire teen years, any part of my adult years that I've been in without a father. Um, and sometimes that really doesn't feel fair. <laughs> and so I think those are the moments that it hits me is when I see, oh, that's a moment when my dad would have been there and he's not. Um, and kind of, that's something I still have to work through from time to time. And I think it gets less and less frequent as time goes on, um, but it still happens, so. Yeah, and it will continue. I mean, it's not that I, I hate to say that, but it just, it changes. It just changes over time. You know, you get married, he won't be there. My family got me a beautiful little locket with my dad's picture in it. And that's what I wore for my jewelry when I got married. and. Um, it was incredibly special to me. Um, so yeah, it just changes over time. You have kids, grandpa's not there, you know, um, the seat's always gone at the table, right? Mm -hmm. So it sounds like to me that communication was actually a really important tool used, actually used in your family to navigate that loss and share how you were feeling. What, is that correct? I mean, that's the kind of sense I get that, that communication was really um, utilized during that time. Yeah. 
Yes, I, I definitely agree with that. I think um, there were times, again, like it, it's always a mixture of like, there were times when I didn't really feel like our family could communicate well and like be open with each other um, just because of the different ways that we were all handling it. But there were also times when I was able to sit down with my mom or with my siblings um, and just, yeah, share what we were feeling and know that other people were in the same boat. Um, and yeah, um, even recently, like we've been able to have conversations. We try to celebrate or, or spend time together on certain anniversaries for my dad, um, like his birthday, the anniversary of the day he died. Um, we'll just get together and remember him um, and spend time together and um, sometimes talk about like where we're at with it. And I think we, we probably talk less and less about, I, I don't know, it's, just, it's different every year. Um, and the way it impacts all of us, it like continues to grow and change. But I think being able to grieve together and deal with that loss together has been, um, yeah, really helpful and really a blessing that I know not everyone has. So, mm, like I didn't. So yeah, that is wonderful because I think when we're able to communicate with how we're feeling honestly and openly. Um, that brings healing. And then you're healing as a unit, as a family. Um, during that time too, where even before your dad got sick and like even maybe when your grandmother passed, has your family always been very strong in faith? Yes. So, um, yeah, my, we've always gone to church together as a family. I mean, we did growing up, of course, now I'm the youngest of four. So all my siblings are adults and we all kind of um, are still involved in different churches, but um, yeah, it's always been an important part of our lives. Um, it was definitely something um, that we talked about around like my grandmother's death and then um, something that, yeah, it's really important to my parents and they always taught us to like read our Bibles and um brought God into important conversations. Um, and that was really impactful to me, especially like thinking of my dad's legacy, like continuing to um, walk in the faith that he helped me to establish. So after he passed, how did that change, if at all? Yeah, um, it, it's interesting, I guess, to me, like trying to think through that, because I think when my dad was sick, there was a lot of um, conversations among my family and especially with our friends about like prayer for healing, um, which was definitely um Yeah, it, it just brought up a lot of questions for me um, when, you know, he wasn't healed and a lot of people we knew had like so much confidence that he would be. Um, but I remember, you know, my parents said like, we trust God or my, my mom actually talks about a conversation she had um, where someone asked her like, why aren't you, or I, I think she was telling a story about someone else, actually, now that I think about it. But someone had said, like, why aren't you trusting God to heal this person? And she said, no, I'm trusting God, whether he heals this person or not. Um, and I think, like, that was her attitude toward my dad's illness. Um, and I've tried to um, take on that attitude, too. And it's definitely a challenge sometimes even looking back like I said and sometimes I just ask God like why why can't I have a dad in my life anymore like this is really hard um but I do really believe that he's worked through that and I think like after losing my dad um that was something specifically that I had to work through but I also I knew that I really needed God <laughs> um and that I wasn't going to be able to deal with such a huge loss um without my faith and without a relationship with God, um, continuing. Um, and yeah, I really came to rely on God even more, um, 
through my dad's illness and then after he passed away um, and just looking to God, like I said, I look to him for emotional support as I'm dealing with grief. And I look to him for, um, you know, with my questions and with, um, sorry, with, um, yeah, sometimes things that I would have looked to my dad for because he was such an important, um, source of like someone I could ask questions to and someone I could turn to when I got anxious. Um, and, you know, ask, you know, feel protected by in different situations. And so I've transferred a lot of that over to God. And it's definitely different um, because God's not like a physical person in my life. Um, but it, he's also, um, yeah, I've just learned that like God is ever present with me. And that's something my dad never could have promised. Um, and I think that's really special and is really um helped grow my faith, um, even though it's been difficult. So, yeah. I'm interested in hearing your side or your perspective, because when I was a kid, I believed, and granted I was eight, you know, even 11, 12, you probably maybe know differently, but when I was eight and my dad passed away, you know, I went to the funeral, he's put in the ground, and I thought that's what happens when you die, you just go into the ground. And we did go to church, but granted I was eight and you know, these big concepts you can't really grasp necessarily at that age. Um, but I guess how did that, when I'm thinking about my experience and how like that loss really took us out of the church, like I blamed God, right? Like, cause you're taught like, like you just said, and my mom had this firm belief, like, he'll make it, he'll be fine, they'll do what they can. And when she realized that that's not the case, that he will die, um, she was devastated and crushed and really didn't know how to cope with that. And so we fell out of the church. And that was the case for me until I was in my, until I was probably, until I was like 23. And my life was a, kind of a, did a nosedive <laughs> until I came back to my, till I found faith again. So I can speak to that side of it when you don't have, when you lose faith, when you come back to it. Um, I love that growing up, that was still a part of your grieving process, that that was something that was made valuable and important in a part of healing. Um, because I know for a lot of people, when someone they love dies, they want someone to blame, right? You want, and who's the easiest to blame is God, you know, because you're supposed to heal people, you know? And so, yeah, I struggled with a, a lot of those emotions, but I didn't have the language. I didn't have the open communication like you did. And so that, that is a wonderful blessing um, that I just want to reflect back to you. Um, because I really think that whether you realize it now or not, um, that does and has an impact on the decisions that you make in your life and the choices you make. Um, so for anyone listening, it's, it's, there's no like linear path to losing your faith and finding your way back to it again, but often it's, um, you know, it's going to be <laughs> take a pen and scribble and doodle. And it's, that's, that's what it looks like. It's not a straight A to B, point A to point B. Um, trying to think how I want to pivot just a second. <laughs> Okay. I'm trying to think how I want to. Um, Cause you don't want to speak to your family, which I get that. Um, can I ask this question? Cause I'm, I'm just curious in 
If you want to edit it out, that's fine. Um, did your mom ever remarry? Uh, no, she didn't. Oh, okay. Um, my mom did within two years. So that was, you know, another huge change and stuff. So I was just, I was just curious. Um, so as you've been navigating this loss of your father, as it's changed over time, and as you've gotten older, um, I know you had mentioned too that your uncle had passed away the same way. Is that correct? Yeah, it was very similar. Um, he actually, he had a different form of cancer, um, but it was, yeah, it was very much felt like going back into losing my father in so many ways because um, he was my dad's brother. Um, he was um, definitely... Um, someone from my dad's family had stayed very close to our family after losing my dad. He was an important part of um, my grief process and had been, you know, really there for our immediate family when that happened. And of course, it was also a big loss for him. Um, and then he actually had cancer for about six years um, and then passed away in 2019. Um, and so going to visit him and seeing him in hospice care like my dad had been um he was in so my uncle was in home and my father had been in a um, hospice facility when he passed away but um yeah just seeing him in such a similar state was um really kind of brought me back to that earlier loss um and then i think having lost my father and really knowing deeply what that meant um and saying goodbye to him for the last time was really um just impactful and really challenging knowing that like it was only a matter of time um but I think also again having had that loss before and the blessing of a family who had helped me um, continue a relationship with the Lord and leaning into God, I I felt more prepared for another loss like that. And really, um, and also knowing, I think even clear as an adult, like where, um, and just believing um, that my uncle would um, be in heaven with God and with my um, with my father, um, because I knew, you know, their faith in God, that that's, um, what Jesus would do for them. And, um, that was really encouraging to me in a really deep way, even when it hurt, um, that, yeah, that they weren't just going into the ground, um, that they had, a continuation of life it just I didn't get to be a part of it for a while <laughs> um yeah so I think yeah definitely a challenge but also something that I was prepared for and um I think in some ways it like seeing someone suffer through illness can be so hard but I think I've been very blessed in some ways by the fact that I've, you know, none, none of the people in my family that I've lost have been sudden, like I've gotten to kind of prepare myself and say goodbye and um, yeah, and then know where they're going afterwards is really, really encouraging to me and has made such a big difference. It's really just kind of bizarre how similar our stories are. Um, yeah, it's just really strange. Um, my uncle wasn't in my life after my dad passed. Um, he was his brother as well. But um, when I found out he had brain cancer, I went and I knocked on his hospital door, not knowing if he would want to even see me or recognize me even because it had been almost 30 years to the day that my dad had passed. And um, 
it turned out to be one of the most healing experiences for me um, to revisit that relationship, to open up my heart to him again, and um, when he had been absent. And um, yeah, I felt a connection to my dad that I had not felt in the 30 years prior. Um, so I'm interested in learning what your experience has been of, like, you know, there's faith and then there's spirituality. And I don't, I don't necessarily view them exactly the same. Um, I feel like for me, spirituality is almost more, is almost a deeper knowing, a deeper connection or a deeper feeling um, is what it's evolved for me. So what role does spirituality play for you and through your experience? Um, yeah, that's interesting. I don't know. Like, do you feel, you know, when we talk about faith, we talk about God, right? Mm -hmm. when we, spirituality, it's, it's, you know, our guardian angels, it's like the people that, like our guides, like people that are ever present um, and all around us, mm -hmm. um, you know, kind of watching over you, your guardian angels, things like that. Um, I guess I, it took me a long time to get to that, um, probably only in the last five, six years, to be honest. Um, it's like faith came first and then my spirituality came. Um, I guess where, where you sit with that. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I've had a lot of, of conversations throughout uh, my journey with loss about, um, yeah, like, um, people sharing things like, oh, um, like your dad can see what's happening or like, like they're still with you in a way. Um, and I think I'm still at a point where that's kind of confusing to me. Like, I don't know. Um, and even thinking about guardian angels, like, I don't know, um, like, you know, whether that's a person you've lost or someone different that God sent to help you. Like, I definitely think that's possible that that's a way um, and that that exists, but it's not necessarily something that I've, I haven't quite gotten to the point you're at. Um, it sounds like, um, cause I think, I think in some ways I'm just afraid of being wrong that I'm going to like comfort myself with some idea and then find out later, like, no, that's just something that was in your head or like something sweet that people told you. Um, but yeah, I guess I don't know yet, um, like whether, yeah, it's, it's just, I guess, not something that I've really chosen to lean into yet or really um, focus on for myself. Um, yeah. You might be interested in listening to, um, I'm trying to think what episode number it is, but it's with Victoria Shaw. And she's okay. my podcast and um, she, it was on recently, actually, her episode just went live, I think three or four episodes back. Um, but she is a medium and she's also a, a licensed clinical therapist, um, but she's a medium. And we talk a lot about like just this really tapping into our, our intuition and our inner knowing and, but how, it's, 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 um, it's deeper than that. It's this spiritual guidance. Um, mm -hmm. So you might be interested in that episode. Um, again, like I said, like, this is not something that I really leaned into myself until maybe five or six years ago. And it really wasn't until that experience with my uncle that um, just really had a profound experience um, 
in it for me when it comes to feeling a connection, feeling that connection to my dad that I had not ever felt, you know? Mm-hmm. And it was almost like, because there's a thing too, like when I found out he had brain cancer, um, I could have easily just been like, he hasn't been in my life for 30 years. Why would I go see him? Why would I want to talk to him, right? But I felt a pull. Like I, I felt like I had to go see him. Like it was something I had to do. And call it synchronicity, call it serendipity, call it spiritual guidance. But when I went there within 10 minutes, um, my cousin who I hadn't even remembered meeting before from Massachusetts walked through the door. And so did his daughter who I had not seen either since I was a kid. Mm -hmm. And so it was like this almost immediate reunion. Um, and, And it was amazing. It was an amazing experience. So anyway, it's something to maybe just open your heart to and see where, where you're led. Right. That's all yeah. I think about that. Open your okay. heart when it, it comes to that. Yeah. If I can add something um, that came to mind as you were sharing. Yeah. Um, I do think um, well, well, like the, what am I trying to say? I think the closest I've come to that that sort of experience and those things you're describing, um, is I would describe my experience with, um, yeah, a sense of like some spiritual guidance and some presence with me um, would be, um, I would describe it as like the Holy Spirit's work. Um, I don't know if many of your listeners will know what I mean by that, um, mm-hmm. but like, um, being a Christian and like, um, believing that, um, God is like three persons and one of them is, um, with us as like, um, especially like with believers as, um, the spirit inside of us. Um, and I think, um, I've definitely received some comfort through that and some guidance. Um, I think the Holy Spirit has helped me come to like some of the conclusions I have and the, the peace that I have um, in regards to death um, in regards to like people I love um, and so yeah I know that's not quite the same as what you're describing but I think there is some some like spiritual guidance and some like spiritual presence that's so something so beyond the physical um, that's really present with me um, and again, even that is something that I want to, you know, I don't feel like I um, lean on the Holy Spirit or um, like, I, I want to grow in that even. Um, yeah. So that's, that's what came to mind anyway. No, I, and I totally, I, I resonate with that too. I do. I think for me, it was like, I think too, like our, well, grief for me, like pretty, pretty much put a veil over my inner knowing. Like, I, I, I don't know, I'm asking, I'm actually interested in learning too from you. Do you feel like you've grown in a better understanding of who you are and of yourself through this? Or do you feel like you've, um, you're almost like moving further away from yourself? If that makes sense. Yeah, that does make sense. I think, um, yeah, I think there's probably some of each. There's definitely um, been times when I feel kind of detached and um, because I think, I think grief impacts us so heavily that there's times when we don't feel like ourselves. Um, And so that's been a part of it. But I also, I do think overall, I have really gotten to know myself better through this. And part of it is um, a certain level of independence that comes when you lose someone that integral to your life. Um, That, you know, since my dad passed away, I can't just go to him with my questions and assume that he's right anymore. Um, I have to process through this myself and I definitely like my mom helps me work through things and other people in my life 
Um, but I, I think I've become a little more independent in the way that I think and the way that I make decisions through not having that person who in my life was really probably my main source of, um, guidance and, um, stability even in some ways. And so I've really learned um, more what I think and what I believe um, and also grown in like, okay, how do I take care of myself and like walk through like these difficult seasons and like walk through um, not having these people in my life. I think it yeah, it's all been a journey of getting to know myself and getting to kind of work with myself in ways that I haven't had to before um, with each loss that's come. Has anything else helped you along the way? Um, other, like, has it just been your faith that you've leaned on? I don't want to say just your faith, because that's, I mean, it's huge, but um, aside from faith in your prayer life, um, did your family, did you go to counseling or were you offered counseling or, you know, any other healing modalities that you've found helpful or that were a priority in your life? Yeah. Um, initially after my dad passed away, um, counseling or like support groups weren't really, I think on my family's radar. Um, so we, we did have a lot of family that supported us, but it was definitely, um, yeah, it was, you know, they weren't, we didn't have like professionals really helping us work through it, um, until I think about a year or two after my dad died, we joined a grief support group through Hospice of the Valley. Um, and so me and my mom and sister, were part of that. And that was so helpful to me to just go to a group once a week and talk with people who'd had similar losses. Um, my sister and I were in like a teen group. Um, and so it was a lot of people our age who had lost parents or other family members um, or close friends. And it was just so helpful to talk with people who understood and who had similar experiences and hear about theirs and talk about ours and just know, like, even if we weren't directly talking about our grief, like these are people who understood and didn't feel like they had to walk on eggshells around us, but also didn't, um, you know, weren't going to be insensitive to our grief either. Um, and then also our leaders who helped us walk through exercises to kind of process our grief and um, think about different ways to heal and still remember. Um, so that was really helpful. And then later on, um, I think I was about 14 when I started going to counseling, um, not specifically for grief. I was dealing with a lot of anxiety at the time and um, some different issues. And so I walked into that. My first experience with counseling was kind of difficult. Um, I didn't feel like I felt like it was just a lot of like work and I didn't know if it was really helping me. And then my next counselor was really helpful in processing um, the other things I was dealing with, but also the loss of my father and how that was impacting me. Um, and then, um, yeah, so those are some different tools that I really, really impacted me. I think finding um, a counselor or a therapist who can really help you is so, such a blessing and so incredible and helpful. What did grief look like on you as a teenager? Like if someone would have looked at you, could they have seen that you were a griever? Like what, what, how did that manifest in your life at that age? I think as a teenager, there was, yeah, I don't know how many people knew. I started blogging at some point in my teen years, actually, um, about like grief and living without a father. Um, and that was something that helped me kind of 
express what I was feeling and kind of worked as like a public journal for me. Um, it wasn't something a lot of people read, but it definitely was a way that I expressed my grief. Um, and, you know, posts on social media, I think were another way that I kind of expressed my grief and just let people know, because I think one of the hardest things for me, especially as a teen was like having to tell people, um, because I was always nervous about their reactions, um, whether like it would just make them uncomfortable or whether they would be overly sympathetic or not sympathetic enough. Um, and so I think like getting it out on social media and being like, like, know this, so I don't have to tell you in person, but also getting to share like what he had meant to me. Um, yeah, I don't really know if someone, you know, could have looked at me and seen my grief um, just in everyday life. Um, but I think there were situations coming up, it seemed like all the time where, um, yeah, know, where the question would come up or where, um, yeah, just different things would impact me in a unique way um, because of my grief. And there's always this question of like, do I invite people into this with me and like share this or do I let people have their experience and try to kind of hold back and deal with this on my own? Um, and so sometimes I would, I would turn to my family with that and sometimes it was literally just me kind of taking some time aside to be like, okay, this, you know, whether it's Father's Day or um, a conversation I have with a roommate about um, their father or their experience with loss, something that kind of brings back something that's like so much bigger than where the conversation already was. Um, and I have to either bring that up and face whatever reaction people might have or either like bottle that in or step aside and process it on my own. I've learned there are two types of people in life, either internal processors or external processors and external processors, they need to talk it out. They need to talk, talk, talk. And that's where talk therapy can really help someone who's an external processor. It's like they have their awareness and their insights as they're talking and they need to talk in order to get those and feel those and have that awareness. But then there's internal processors. And I'm guessing that you're an internal processor like me, where we kind of need to go inside ourselves and be alone with our thoughts to process. And just the fact that you started with a blog, um, I had actually journaled. That's when I really got into journaling is um, when, I was a, when I was a kid. Um, and I've been journaling ever since. Um, but I grew up in the age of dial-up internet. <laughs> and so we didn't have, uh, uh, there wasn't social media. There wasn't really blogs. Um, I didn't even have internet at home. So, you know, it was like at school, you know, anyway very different time that I grew up in. And so I think that's a huge benefit to someone growing up today. Um, you know, children that may lose a parent today actually have this huge broad network available to them, which can be good and it can be bad because in my line of work as a grief recovery specialist, um, and I'm, I'll, I want to share this with you too, because you said, you know, you don't know who necessarily to share it with is we don't want to share with just anybody, right? Because they can say hurtful and harmful things that actually make us pull back and isolate even more because we don't feel safe to share. And so we want to look for someone who really doesn't have any skin in our game. Now, I know your family is a huge connection for you and that's, that's great. But sometimes the relationship is, no, not sometimes, always. You can have this, like you and your siblings, your mom, you all experience the same loss, but your experience is very differently. Your experience is very different because your relationship was very different. And that was my experience too. I was the youngest. Um, my siblings were five and nine years older. So our experiences were very different. And, um, 
So you can have the same loss and very different experiences within a family unit. So they might not be necessarily the best people to share with because their perspective of that person might be very different from yours because their experience was different. And so that comes to friends and everything, like someone that doesn't have any skin in your game who you feel safe sharing and someone who is safe, who is a heart with ears, like we say in grief recovery, is someone who's not gonna criticize, analyze, or judge. And so someone who really can just be a heart with ears, just listen. Because that's all people really need to do, is just listen, right? Yeah, that's, that's all we really agree. want, yeah, is to be heard, yeah. to be heard. Um, and your story matters, your experience matters. And that's why I started this podcast because whether you're 21 or 41 and you've had the same type of loss, our experiences are very different. And your perspective that you bring to my listeners matters because there might be some 21 year old, 20 year old, a 15 year old who's listening to you and hearing your story. And they resonate more with you because you're closer to their age, you know? Um, I very much remember what 21 felt like. Um, I was lost. I was absolutely lost. My grief had me lost for decades. Um, but it doesn't have to be that way. We all, but we all find our way in our own time. We all come to a place of, I got this, but then we might have another loss that just opens up that can of worms again. You know, and for your uncle, that's what, that's what that loss did. My uncle, same thing. It's like, that's when I realized I wasn't okay. Like I still haven't processed a lot from that, from all those other losses I had before, I still had a lot of work to do. And that's what that loss made me realize. Like I'm not okay. And that's what led me to grief recovery. And so it's an ongoing process. You're gonna have more losses in your life. That's a guarantee. Um, and because grief is cumulative and it's cumulatively negative, it just all stacks up. But so does the healing that we, the things that we participate in that help us to heal those wounds, not to band-aid them, not to like just sugarcoat what's going on. It's being honest with ourselves, how we're really feeling. Um, I think that's, I think we're out of integrity the most when people ask you, you know, how are you feeling? I'm fine. And you're not fine. And you know, you're not fine. Like you're out of integrity with yourself. When you're out of integrity with yourself, that doesn't feel good. And so it's this ongoing suffering that we cause ourselves just by not being honest with how we really feel. And so, and it's not being apologetic about it. Like you don't have to be sorry that you feel bad you know, one day. It could be your friend, it could be a friend's, let's say you're at a birthday party for a friend's dad, right? And you're just not feeling it. Like you cannot be happy. And you can pretend all you want. And your friend might say, well, can't you just be happy? And it's like, you know, this is too soon. I can't do this right now. I'm so sorry. You know, it's just being honest. Like if a situation is too much, it's walking away gracefully. And saying, I need this time for myself. I need to, you know, we have, you'll have instances that the rest of your life like that. But with age comes wisdom. <laughs> That's all I can tell you. And um, things change. Life changes. Grief changes. Just, it, you know, grief is grief. It just looks different over time. As time just passes. It doesn't do it. Time doesn't heal. It just passes. That's all it is. Um, so what has grief taught you so far? Yeah, um, I think we've kind of already touched on a lot of the things I was thinking about with what it's taught me, but um, yeah, like the 
I, I think it's this interesting mix of like independence and dependence that I've kind of learned through the process of like, I had a conversation with someone a few years ago um, who'd been through a similar loss. And I, um, he said like, I think everything that you miss from someone you've lost is something you have to, especially like with losing a parent is something you have to like learn to do yourself and um, like be more independent in. Um, and I think in some ways that's true, but also I think we really do need other people and other support to help us with those things sometimes because, um, yeah, I, I just don't think I could continue um, or at least like be in the, the place I'm in, which is, I'm really blessed to be in, um, without the support I've had from others, um, of whether it's, you know, my mom still being one like stable parent figure in my life, or, um, my brother's kind of stepping in and providing some of that like sense of safety in certain situations or, um, helping me several people throughout my family helping me financially to be able to go to college and have the resources I need to um, be the student that I want to be. Um, I really, like I've learned that there's a lot that I can do on my own and that I, I do have the strength to walk through so much grief and that's, um, but that's all with some level of support. Like I couldn't, um, yeah, so I guess, yeah, it's taught me that um, that I need people um, and also that, that I am strong as an individual, but that I, like, I, I don't know if that makes yeah. sense, that, like, yes, balance. because, and... yeah, it's like you're strong as an individual. You don't have to be strong for everybody and yourself. You can still, like, it's not weak to ask for help. And that's what, I'm glad you brought that up because that's a good point to bring across and how if someone were to give advice or counsel like that, who has not really dug into their own grief, that's where they can say something that could really send someone else into deep isolation. Because if you were to take that to heart, right? Like, you're just going to have to do this on your own. Like, you're going to have to learn all this stuff on your own. And you'd really internalize that. You would have a really difficult time asking for help. You would think, well, I guess I'm just on my own. I guess this is how life is. This is what it's like. Because that person is going to give you advice and their perspective based on their personal experience, right? So if they have not had the support in their life, if they had not felt like they and ask for the support in their life, that's the perspective they're bringing to your conversation and what you share. And that's why I say it's really important to choose wisely who you communicate with your grief about. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, yeah, I, I, and what has led, because you have a podcast, it's called Loving Diversity Podcast. Um, and I was kind of, I was poking around a little bit and it's about, you know, the, the, um, inclusive, inclusivity, is that a word? <laughs> Inclusiveness? I think, I think it's so. <laughs> inclusiveness of, of faith. Um, has these experiences of grief and loss, has that what shaped you into this mission or this passion for starting this podcast? And, and tell me a little bit about it. Yeah, so um, I was actually inspired to, well, I guess going back even farther, and I think um, for a long time, I've been very aware of kind of, and just like curious about, honestly, the differences, um, just how the church seems to be kind of divided up into, you know, we have like, and it's not, it's not that anyone's necessarily labeling themselves this way or um, doing this intentionally necessarily, but we tend to have kind of like, um, you know, churches that are for a certain or tend to um, be filled with a certain demographic racially or, um, 
culturally or like economic status wise. Um, and they, that, that's kind of how we tend, even as Christians within Christianity, we tend to gather based on other things that we have in common. Um, and as I've read scripture and studied church history, um, I've noticed like, that's not how the church started, like the church churches and like the house churches that started in the first century really broke a lot of the barriers that the rest of culture had around um, socioeconomic status and race and gender and age and all those things. Like the church was a place that broke that in a unique way early on. Um, and now I feel like there's so much division in the church, whether it's um, based on different doctrines or especially, yeah, like social economic status or race or um, just preferences in worship. Um, and then, so that's something that's like been on my mind for a long time. And there's some grief in that of like, why is the church to say like, why can't we all be one like group of Christians like God seems to have intended us to be. Um, and then in March of last year with all the, um, that's when I really became aware of issues with racism in America and really allowed myself to start to process that and see like, okay, how can, like, first of all, starting to understand the reality of the situation and grieve um, the losses that were happening in that time just for, just of people, you know, not people I knew. Um, and then think about, you know, what's my part in this? Um, and how can I help to address this and like help people <laughs> respect one another and build a better culture? Um, I really started thinking about the church again. Um, and there's a quote from Martin Luther King Jr. Um, where he said essentially that the church is one of the most or the most segregated uh, or 11 o'clock on a Sunday morning, I think is what he said was the most segregated time in America. Um, and that had really struck me hard. And anyway, as I was processing, I was thinking, okay, how can I address this? Like the church's um, issues with division. Um, and I started thinking about a podcast because I was like, I want to have conversations with other people. I don't want to just talk about from my perspective, because that's not the point. And I don't even know that much. Um, but what if I could welcome other people in to share their stories and to, um, to speak to their own experience and to speak to what they've learned and um, share their experience with feeling included from certain or included or discluded from certain church communities and how could leadership or people around them have avoided that um, disclusion and help them feel like a part of something and like they were welcome just as a part of God's family rather than having to fit a certain or fit into a certain category in order to be part of that community. I love that. I love that idea. Um, I think that's wonderful. I think it's wonderful. You're, what are you studying in college? Biblical studies. Awesome. Okay. Well that, yeah, that, I mean, it's, Follow that passion wherever it takes you, that interest, that curiosity. Curiosity is a big thing in life. And I think we don't ever lose that. I think that's something that we kind of just tend to put on the back burner is what makes me curious and follow that, follow it. I love that idea. If uh, people wanna reach out to you and they wanna learn more, how can they find you? Yeah, so I'm on Instagram. You can find me at Loving Diversity Podcast. Um, I also, I don't use this account as frequently as I used to, but my um, blog from my grief experience that I was using in high school is Never Fatherless. And I also have an Instagram account for that. So if you're interested in seeing some resources, it may become more active again. But um, if you want to read more about my story, that's there. Um, and you can feel free to... Um, message me through either of those accounts. All right. Thank you so much for sharing your story, um, which deeply resonates with me. And um, I hope we stay connected. And thank you for being here.
thank you. Thank you for having me. It's been great having this conversation. I think we could talk for a couple more hours, actually. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> so uh, thank you for listening. And remember, when you unleash your heart, you unleash your life. Much love.